Hi, I'm Arlene McIntyre, Creative Director at Ventura Design, and you're listening to Shut the Front Door, a lighthearted podcast that will bring you through the front door and into the homes of influential and interesting people. Home for me is one of the most important things in my life. My career has fortunately given me the opportunity to work closely with people and to help them create a home they will cherish forever. Today on Shut the Front Door, we are joined by Irish neuroscientist and chartered health psychologist Sabina Brenner. Last month, Sabina launched her second book, Beating Brain Fog, to rave reviews, and it has just been named as an Irish Times number one bestseller. She is also the creator and host of the Super Brain Podcast, where she talks to inspiring individuals about thriving and surviving in life. Sabina's mission is to get everyone looking after their brain health as routinely as they brush their teeth. She has won many awards in recognition of the societal impact of her work and for her contribution to STEM communication. She was listed as one of Image Magazine's Women of the Year in 2018. Sabina is the go-to person for Irish and international media on discussions related to brain health and in particular dementia and aging. Married with two sons, we are delighted to chat to Sabina today. Welcome Sabina to Shut the Front Door. Thank you and I love the name of your podcast. (laughs) Well, it's different. Yeah, it's great. It's great. (laughs) So how was your Easter? Uh, Yeah, fine. Kind of pretty much the same as every day for the last year. (laughs) Yeah. Did you smother yourself with chocolate? Uh, No, we we were relatively good. I bought three small packets of Marks and Spencers, you know, those kind of crinkly coated little eggs, you know, the Mm -hmm. ones that they're solid chocolate and they've kind of got Mm -hmm. this um, delicious. And I, well, I ate most of those three packets over uh, all the days before (laughs) Easter. And uh, I got my son, my husband, a lovely, um, yeah, uh, what do you call it? Butler's chocolate egg, which we also ate before Easter. So we we're very good. We didn't yeah. have any chocolate on Easter Sunday because we had it all before. <laughs> <laughs> I did the opposite. I did. I actually did wait until Sunday and then I I, I didn't eat loads of chocolate, but I but I kind of, there was periods where you just took like a few handfuls of chocolate with a coffee and it's gorgeous. Yeah, I'm better so. off. I'm one of those all or nothing people. So I can go, you know, months without anything sweet, nothing sweet in the house, won't have oh. it and I can be really rigid. But once you put one in front of me, I want the whole packet. Like I really, I know I'm dreadful. I have no self-control in that way. I can contri- completely control myself. But once I get that taster, um, I'm oh, off. I know. I know, I know, I know. So good. Do you like milk chocolate or dark dark chocolate? Milk chocolate. Mm, I like dark chocolate. Um, yeah, that's my. Hard. That's what I'm doing now. Sort of for if I have a sweet craving, I keep a bar of like seventy or eighty mm-hmm. percent dark chocolate mm-hmm. and just take a tiny little segment because that's enough with dark mm-hmm. chocolate. Dark chocolate. I think it's hard to overeat dark chocolate. That's true. That's true. Actually, there's one that we get. I'm not sure where we get it from, but it has raspberry in it. (gasps) Yeah, love that. Love Mm. that. And I've made my own little, um, actually, made my own little chocolate pennies. They come from, uh, so sometimes I do like the 800 fast, you know, it's like intermittent fasting. Um, But it's lots of little recipes and it has a little treat recipe, which is lovely. It's made from dark chocolate. All you do is melt the dark chocolate and you pour out little pennies, you know, and then you Mm. put a couple of raisins and you toast some um, almond slivers and put them on top and they're like little mini Florentines very nice um, and they're only about 25 calories each so it's like have one of those after dinner and that's your your sweetness sorted yeah yum yum it gets kind of the taste of dinner out of your mouth yeah yeah and the the raisins kind of make it sweet sweet Sweet. you know tonight yeah yeah and then you get the little crunch of the almonds delicious delicious so how has life been treating you in lockdown uh, not too bad, actually. Um, I've been kept busy and, um, yeah, well, I had to write my book during the first, <laughs> the first yeah. few months of it. So that was pretty busy. And I had just started my first episode of my podcast went out on the 9th of March. And so shortly thereafter, we went into lockdown and I couldn't go into a studio. So I had a really steep learning curve and I had been doing face to face interviews. So that kind of kept me um kept me really, really busy. Um, and um, yeah, I've been working away. It was really tough at first because I lost my job because uh, my day job as a researcher, because I can't do my research with older people face to face, my whole team. Um, 
lost our jobs because we, you know, I mean, people come into us for an hour and a half face to face assessments. They're all over 60, some of them up to 90. Um, and so simply just not possible. My husband lost his job. My son, who's a musician, all his touring gigs were cancelled. So that was kind of tough enough. And then my other son who had a job, we had that added worry because he's a doctor and he also has um, a vulnerable health condition. So in the one person who was working, we were kind of going, God, I wish he wasn't working. Oh my <laughs> but, gosh. Uh, thankfully, wow. my husband um, uh, has had his job reinstated. My doctor son has been vaccinated uh, and uh, my son is a musician. He still can't tour or anything, but he's actually taken the time to do, um, uh, he's retraining uh, or doing some new training as a sound designer, you know, for movies and stuff like that. Wow, so cool. he's he's enjoying that. Yeah, and he's done some composing and he's got, you know, I mean, he said initially the, the lockdown turned him um, from a performer to a, um, an Arts Council grant writer. <laughs> <laughs> but he got, he got grant funding for a couple of nice projects too. So, you know, I think we're all we've all kind of, um, I've really embraced actually not working in the university. It's given me more time to devote to sort of the more, uh, how would you put it, science communication side of my work, which is really what does, uh, it really motivates me. You know, I'm really uh, sort of driven by that. I just think there's so much information out there that is not available to the general public because of the way it's written, because it's in scientific journals that you can't access. And a lot of it is really, really valuable information that can empower people. And I kind of feel very strongly motivated to do that. You know, I kind of feel like I'm doing something good, not to sound saintly or anything, but that's important to me, you know, to kind of feel that you're, you're doing something that has a purpose. No, I, I, it's, it is, it's so interesting. I, I've been listening to you on news talk. I just seem like, it seems like every radio station I turn on, you're there. Oh, it's just so interesting. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to chat to this girl. Well, honestly, in fairness now, that's like, you know, when you, when you, when you publish a book, they, you know, try and get you on everything. But I, I think I'm also very lucky because the brain is my thing and everybody is fascinated by the brain and whatever I'm talking about, it's always about you. <laughs> yeah. Because you have rain. So, um, yeah, yeah. I think most people are interested in how they work. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I actually contacted a very good friend of mine and she's a clinical psychologist. And I was like, I'm, I'm chatting with Sabina Brennan tomorrow. And do you have any good questions you might share with me to ask her? And she said, please tell Sabina that I'm suffering from brain fog myself. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And I thought, I thought, I thought she was joking, but she actually was serious. And she's like, no, seriously. Yeah. For the last few weeks, I've really been experiencing what seems like brain fog. So yeah, yeah. A lot of, pe- a lot of people. So I hope I'm, I've been getting lovely. Um, I've been getting lovely emails and letters from people, um, uh, who have either heard me on the radio or read the book. And uh, yeah, it's really kind of quite moving to to actually go, OK, this is what I intended, but it seems abstract at first. But to actually, you know, get real people to come back to you and say, oh, thank you so much. I thought there was something yeah. dreadful wrong and I've read the book and I've implemented. And the thing is, with the tips in the book is um you know, for some people, depending on the un- underlying causes, and, and there's many, and it's often multiple causes, but depending on that, I mean, people can start to see improvements really, really rapidly. Yeah. Um, you know, so, um, yeah, that's kind of great. It means a lot to me. Because when wow. you're writing and and, and and doing stuff like that, you're so far removed from people. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, it is very nice when people take the time. And one woman actually wrote a letter for me, and, and it, it, it eventually got to me. She just sent it to Trinity College. So, um yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, it is. It's ex- it's exciting for you. You're on this exciting journey. Mm-hmm. Well, let me first um, start by asking you what your first childhood memories of home were. And can you share those with me? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, my very first memory of home was sitting under the kitchen table. Um trying to understand and upset because I wasn't allowed to go to school. (laughs) I was the youngest of five and all the others used to go out to school every day. And obviously I was left at home. I mean, these were, there wasn't, well, I don't believe that there was, kindergarten wasn't really a thing when I was, uh, when I was small growing up. So I was at home with mum. So that's my first recollection. And I suppose that was the hub of the house. We lived in a 1950s, you know, 
standard, uh, what would have been a three bed house, but we had a garage and then two bedrooms over the garage and the kitchenette. So, yeah, the kind of the, the we called it, I mean, those 1950 houses, with you know, the kitchens were really quite small. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a kitchenette. Um, and I think we probably had, uh, I, I do remember that the houses had those kind of very 1960s colours, you know, the mustard yellow yes. and, and the green. Now, my mum had knocked down the the wall between the kitchen and the breakfast room. So that was kind of where we lived and ultimately sort of extended out another little room out beyond that. But I do remember uh, neighbours built, apparently my dad was out the garden um, one day and the neighbours on the left side of our house, the south side of our house, where the sun would come from, said to my dad, we're thinking of building an extension. Do you mind? And dad said, not at all. Go ahead. <laughs> and it became the bane of my mother's life because they built the whole length um, of the south uh, of that wall and blocked all the light from our, our kitchen and our breakfast room. Um, uh, so I suppose that's partly why I love light and I always make sure I'm always very, very, uh, very attuned to where light is coming from and how you can get yeah. light into rooms. I, I just think it's critical. Yeah, totally. And uh, tell me about your teenage bedroom then. So, yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, so I do remember... I slept in a few different rooms in the house, you know, as we changed, you know, kind of growing up. My mother liked to change things around a bit or move furniture. So I think I slept in all but my parents' bedroom at at some point or at a different age. Um, But for teenage years, I did have my own bedroom. It was a big bedroom at the back of the house. And I remember... uh, painting the skirting boards and door surrounds black Uh, and I had a chair in the room and I painted it black (laughs) and then I think I picked out wallpaper I wouldn't say it was on a shade of 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 pink but you know where it's that pink turning to um there'd be tones of wine or purple underneath it but not a girly pink um Mm -hmm. and unfortunately um you know the carpet wasn't up for up for changing do you know that carpets went down in houses then and they (laughs) stayed there for like 40 or 50 years I think (laughs) I think the carpet I had as a teenager is still uh, there in that old house or was um, and it was red so there was nothing you could do oh with my it. God, it was red color. with zigzag you know there was a lot of that sort of zigzaggy mm-hmm. design sort of back in the 70s and I think there was bits of yellow and bits of black and you uh, you know in terms of a teenage room I was thinking in terms of posters on the wall and that kind of thing I yeah. didn't have them when I was a teenager I reckon more as a preteen because I remember them in a different bedroom do you know what I mean I can yes. kind of my my memories are, well, I was that age in that room and I was that age in that room. And so I remember them more as a preteen and it would have been kind of Bay City Rollers and David Cassidy, whatever you could you could get your hands on, stuck up with sellotape, but also pictures of my dog and stuff like that. How cute. So when did you leave the nest? Did you? I left the nest at 24 and I had that, I left the nest and moved into my first house that I bought. Like I literally um, and got married. Um, yeah. So uh, I had no experience of kind of living away from home until I went wow. completely. <laughs> well, do you know, there was kind of a funny thing. I don't know whether it was just my family, but my mother, her belief was you didn't leave home unless you were leaving it to get married as a girl anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know what I mean? Because why else oh, yeah. would you not want to live at home? <laughs> and uh, I, I did have brothers, like, my, but my brother they and my sister, they all left and they lived somewhere else. So I think that was, that was okay because they were either living in another country in the UK or the US or my sister's case down the country. But I didn't do any of that. But I, yeah, I, I, I suspect, um, yeah, we had two options. Either you're leaving to emigrate or you're leaving to get married. <laughs> Yeah, it had to be all or nothing. Yeah, you're either. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, did you did you get to travel at all? Did you travel? Much or it was just straight from the nest to your new home? Straight from the nest to my new home. I went on a holiday, you know, I wouldn't call it travel, travel. You know, I went on girls' mm-hmm. holidays and stuff like that. And we yes. traveled with the kids when they were young. Um, but no, because I got pregnant then the first year I got married. And then oh, wow. after, you know, I just have a year and 10 months between my babies. So, I kind of went 
dropped straight into all of that kind of very soon. In -hmm. recent years, I've done a lot more traveling because my job and I love it. And that's probably the only thing I really, really miss. I'm pretty adaptable and I'm good at working at home. And my home has always been my castle. And I'm a very sociable individual, but I'm also really, really comfortable in my own company and like lots of time on my own. Do do you know what I mean? I think I put a lot of effort in when I'm in company and then that is quite exhausting. Do you know? So I kind of like to have my my downtime as well, but I have missed the, you know, the, like just the going to different, I'd always be going either to speak at at an event or, um, to, you know, to be at at meetings, consultancy meetings or back and forth to London about my book. I miss London Mm -hmm. a lot. I really, I really, uh, uh, the buzz I get when I arrive in London never leaves me. Uh, I don't know what it is about the city. And I used to stay in a lovely hotel there and they were so nice to me. You know, they were, some of them are in hospitality are just great. They make you feel like the only guest or the most important guest. Wow, love that. Yeah, I miss London too. I miss those little trips, those little jaunts across the pond, you know, for work as well. I used to love London. I miss it too. Yeah, I do too. And and I mean, I'd get around to, to, to various cities and, and actually just before lockdown. Yeah, I'd been in a lot of places just in the two months before lockdown and I had just come back from L.A. as well. Uh, just, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but I'm, I'm I, you know, I, I mean, I'm fine with it. You know, it's it's the least of our worries, but I do hope, it's, hope it starts up again and that everybody won't just go, oh, she will just do everything remotely. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and what led you into your acting career? Into my acting career? Mm. Right. Yeah. Well, that was having my kids, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. I went into the permanent pensionable job. I went to work in the same place where my father worked because that kind of was his ambition for one of his kids to work where he worked, which was Irish Life Assurance Company, which was a fast growing uh, life assurance company at the time. And it was a fun place to work. There was... um, I think there was about 2000 employees and I'd say about 17 or 1800 of us were between the ages of 18 and 24. (laughs) So it was more about kind of working to have fun or working to pay for holidays or working to go out socializing. Um, But then I had my kids and um, I kind of, you know, I mean, I always knew I was in a job that I didn't love. And I, I, it is one of those moments when you have kids, you start thinking about the world and the future in a different way and so I said right I'm going to get my kids to find something that they love and find a way to do it Uh, and then I kind of realized well the best way kids learn is by example and I'm not doing what I love Um, so Mm -hmm. uh, yeah it it took a couple of years to do it but I complete I'd always studied drama from the age of eight and I had done my exams with the guild hall so I I completed um I completed my exams remotely and qualified as a drama teacher uh, and set up a little drama school. Um, but it was really becoming an actor that I really, really wanted to do. So um, I, yeah, I just started going for auditions and doing kind of short films for free and kind of working my way, learning learning the ropes of of film and TV acting, because that's really what I loved, whereas I'd been trained as a theatre, um, a theatre actor, wow. really. Um Interesting. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. So tell us about how you decided to go back to college to study after spending all those years in Ireland's most famous soap opera for city. <laughs> well, yeah, well, you know, that's kind of one of those examples where things happen mm-hmm. and you... Uh, look in another direction. So I'll be perfectly honest. I mean, my role ended in Fair City. I would have stayed there forever. I was murdered. So there's no going back from that uh, unless they were going to do a Bobby Ewing on it and bring me back in the shower or or bring me back as a sister. So that was kind of life changing and and really sort of disappointing because it's kind of funny. It's it's, um, the acting profession here is there's quite a click. I'll be perfectly yeah. honest. And you'll, you, all you have to do is watch TV here and watch shows. Yeah. You know, it's the same actors over and over again. Often Absolutely. some of them are really good. Some of them aren't. Um, so I started late. So that was always difficult to kind of, I, you know, I never really broke into a click. Plus I had two kids, so I couldn't do that mm-hmm. socializing sort of thing. You know, I mean, I just felt absolutely blessed that I could actually go and work, act and then come home to the kids, you know, because that wasn't yeah. always necessarily uh, going to be uh, feasible 
feasible. Um, so yeah, I wasn't really part of any clique. And also, um, you know, pretty much the casting agent said, like, you've had such a high profile part, it's going, it's going to take a while before you kind of get other work, which is really strange in another country that would propel you onto other work. But True. I thought then that I would do uh, a night course to keep busy. I'm not very good at doing nothing. Uh, I, I I really became an actor because I'm interested in the human condition. Uh, mm-hmm. And so psychology seemed like a really natural thing uh, to study. And I thought that I would do a night course. And I was looking around for night courses and I found one in Maynooth, NUI Maynooth. And I rang them and while I was on the phone, they told me, well, look, you know, um, our our application deadline for mature students for the full time date for the day course, the day degree. Um, uh, would you consider applying for that? And I said, well, I suppose so. And they said, right, well, can you get your application in by five o'clock? And this was about, wow. this is about 20 past four. <laughs> Oh my God, that was meant to be. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Now, I mean, it was quite a quite a process to get in because there was very limited places on the course. It was a closed course and there was a few places for mature students and we had to sit a written exam and then have one of these interviews with six of the lecturers, etc. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I thought I would combine the acting and the studying, but I just loved mm-hmm. the studying and uh, became that that mature student that all the other students hate um, because you do all the work and you, you study and you, you, you know all the answers. But I loved it. And then um, I, I sort of my career sort of happened, you know, studying wise sort of all happened sort of accidentally, really. You know, as I said, that that was kind of a big, albeit happy accident. Um, and then um yeah, I sort of fell into a PhD, you know, I was kind of going into third year of my undergrad and kind of, well, what do I, I had, I had thought that I would study psychology to become either a clinical psychologist or a counselling psychologist. And I did some part-time volunteering and realised that I don't have the temperament for that. What made me a good actor, and I'm not singing my own praises, but, uh, you know, why why I could act was the very reason why I couldn't be um a, a clinical psychologist or a counsellor. And that's just that my empathy is just too close to the mm. surface, you know. So that's great mm. for acting because you can really draw on it. It is mm-hmm. great for, you know, feeling for people. But I think in those situations, you have to be able, for two reasons, you have to be able to kind of put the lid on that. Um, yeah, detach. You have to detach both for your own mental health and for the patients. Now, in fairness, uh, you know, I always got very good feedback and, you know, from the, the people that I spoke to and was helpful in the moment but I you know I couldn't switch off uh, and I was counseling for the rape crisis center so I just those Gosh. stories would just go round and round and round in my head yeah. and um I just realized no um, um yeah. sort of then I was well what will I do and my supervisor said um would you you should really do a PhD and I honestly and you know me well, how old was I then about 45 didn't even really know what a PhD was mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe if I did know I wouldn't have done it <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I kind of fell into, I got a scholarship to do that in Trinity um, uh, in the Institute of Neuroscience. And then really that then sort of set off the um, the next trajectory, uh, in a sense, was finding all this, all this academic information that was so useful to people. Like, mm-hmm. you know, what, I didn't know that there's, you know, modifiable risk factors for developing dementia, which means, you know, if you know about these things, you can limit your risk for developing the disease. And there's things that you can do to boost your brain. And and I'm kind of going, well, how come I don't know this? And then you look Mm -hmm. and you realize these papers have been published for years, but nobody has translated the information for the general public. And that just seemed morally wrong for me. I really genuinely can say I felt compelled <laughs> yeah. to do that. And I was very fortunate. I wrote, wrote um I wrote a grant to straight out of my PhD. Um I, you know, after you do a PhD, you've got to find funding for your work. Um and uh I wrote uh, a, a grant application to the European Commission. They put out a call. 
And actually, they put out a call for someone to, it was really a PR job in a way. They were wanted someone to highlight the benefit of EU-funded research. Um, so I wrote a very cheeky proposal. Now, these proposals are 90 pages, so like they're re- and you have to bring on part. I'm sure you've done some oh things. Gosh. You've probably done some things, you know, in the architectural space. You have to bring in partners for at least three other European countries mm-hmm. and they have to, you know, one has to be an SME and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I cheekily said to them, I said, nobody's going to be interested in a, an infomercial about how brilliant you are. But I said the European Commission <laughs> wants to add two extra healthy years to uh, European citizens' lives. And the best way to do that is to boost brain health. So you give me the, fun- the, the funding to make a brain health awareness program, and it had to be in multiple languages. And I that w- I will overtly create that and covertly I will push through on that website the research that you have funded that speaks to that. And they bought it and they gave me the money, a million euro. <laughs> Wow. My yeah. God. Yeah. I mean, if I'd known, I knew it was my innocence and my naivety because those projects are aimed. I, I became a coordinator. My very first research grant was as a coordinator of a European Commission funding, which is usually aimed at people who've been kind of running their own labs for 10 or 15 years. But I was oblivious. Incredible. I just, I just, you just kept going. I just you had no fear. Well, because well, yeah. I didn't know what to be fearful know. of, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and, and I think that's really good advice with people. You know, if you feel in, if you feel you can do something, go for it. All that can happen is that you'll uh, you'll get a no, but you'll have learned something along the way. Yeah, very true. Totally agree. How exciting. Okay. So then what inspired you to write your first book, 100 Days to a Younger Brain? Well, that kind of followed really from that. So I, um, in that first project, made use of animations. And they're great because we were doing multilingual. And um, I often find that... Um, you know, a lot of information around dementia and brain health takes itself far too seriously and it's very off-putting and it's all about being sanctimonious and respectful and um, that's not how people learn, you know, and people want to be entertained irrespective of what the the topic is and if edu- so I kind of set out to do something entertaining uh, that the education just fell out naturally you know if something's funny it's really just using what we know about the brain you know if something is funny uh, it's more likely to stick you're more likely to remember it and if something induces empathy you know if you feel for something that all we also know that enhances memory so really it was just about making the content relevant and um, inducing empathy and those first f- films we just use, and I still use some of them, uh, although we haven't made um, animations for a while. Um, uh, they're just these little roundy faced characters, but the actual guys who do the animations, they're just brilliant. The ima- They can make you cry. They can make you laugh. Oh. They can really make you feel, but they transcend boundaries, you know, ethnicities, uh, do you know, everything. And I think sometimes when you use humans in some of these things, you can take a dislike to someone or you're dependent on how good an actor a person is and that can be difficult when it comes to things like dementia you know so the animations uh, they work very well and then I got funding to do s- some uh, some more animations and they just um, they just took off uh, they were covered in like by the RT news wow. <laughs> uh, because they were at the time it doesn't seem groundbreaking but at the time they were the first sort of you know people really weren't talking this is back 2011 I made these so it's 10 years ago now so so they were kind of just considered groundbreaking because they were fun and quirky and they were covering a serious topic, but in a way that, um, you know, kind of got a, a message out there. And so then I, you know, I started giving talks um, about the subject and I suppose, uh, you know, a book was always a next step. And I'd always wanted to write a book, but also being an actor, you I have a very realistic view of how these worlds work. Like I knew as an actor, you'll never get work unless you have an agent, do you know? So like your first yes. job is to try and secure yourself a, a half decent agent. Um, and I knew similarly, you know, within publishing that you need to have an agent and just sending, even though I had the book in my head, do you know, I really had that book carrying it around in my head. I just wasn't prepared to invest all that time writing it and know that you could send it off and it would just sit on, um, you know, could sit in a slush pile for months or years or whatever. And then just another act of fortune. I was um, on 
uh, the Today Show with Dahi and Maura. Yeah. And uh, they actually showed one of my animations. I think I was on talking about sleep and how sleep is really important for your brain. And I'm a real chatterbox in the green room particularly just before I go on air, you know. Uh, but then I came off and, and the gentleman said to me, uh, he was an English gentleman, an older gentleman. Um, uh, is that politically correct to say gentleman now? I mean that in the nicest pl- possible way. <laughs> I, I know is. some women don't like to be called <laughs> ladies, but uh, uh, but he was that real sort of gentleman, uh, early yes. 70s, I'd say at the time. And he just said to me, oh, he said, I really enjoyed that. That was really interesting. And asked me who did my animations because his son was was an animator so we oh. had something in common so I asked him why he was on the show and he said oh I'm a writer and he'd written a series of detective novels with the female lead from Cork and um, I'd written 10 books in that series or something and I kind of went oh my god you've written 10 books I'd love to just write one book and he said well if you were to write a book what would it be and I said oh that's easy about brain health and he said well if you if you write like you speak he said I, I bet you'd be a bestseller he said have you got a card or something oh he said I've got the best agent in London uh, give me your card and uh, you know wow. I'll connect you and I'm sure you've had loads of occasions like that, where someone says something like that, you know, but I thought about it on the train home and I subsequently discovered this man is like huge in the horror genre and has written over a hundred books. Like he's in in, incredible history. And, um, I said, you know what, I'm going to email him tomorrow morning. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I'll give it a go. And I woke up the next morning and he'd already emailed me. He'd already emailed his agent. He'd linked her to my animations and my various websites. And she said, when can she have two chapters? So I dropped everything, took uh, took a week or so off work. And it was relatively easy to write the chapters because I kind of had them in my head and sent them. He very kindly offered to um, have a look through them, you know, as a seasoned writer. So I sent them through to him on the following Sunday and then he emailed me back. I've read them. He said, apart from a couple of typos, I've no changes. I've sent them straight on to the the agent. And she got back to me by the next evening and asked when could I come over? They wanted to, the team wanted to meet me. And yeah, I signed with them and and ultimately they got me my first book deal with a big publisher in the UK, Orion. So um, yeah, it's, it, kind of just for good good fortune I often say that I don't believe in luck but I think um you've got to be you've got to be You've got to be out there you've got to do the work but you've got to recognize opportunities when they present themselves does that sound totally but like every little step you've just mentioned so far has been like it was all meant to be. It's like you've on the path. <laughs> I don't know. But when one bus stops, then you you kind of get on to the next train and then that leads you to another path. And it's so interesting. Yeah, I think that's something, though, I've learned over, uh, you know, over life um, that, you know, when one door closes, don't try and bang it down. Um you know, turn and look and see what other door- doors have opened. Because um, I, I do have to say, like in the early years of being an actor, I probably spent, you know, way too long um, trying to bang down doors that had closed, do you know? Like yes. I think there's no harm in trying, but there really comes a p- point in knowing, well, whether you need to just change direction or look in another direction and see what options, you know, there are there for you. Yeah, yeah, totally. But you do have to have an open mind and see the signs. Yes. And see yes. the opportunities. I actually agree. I think that's so true. And I'm actually I'm super fascinated by your very new book, Beating Brain Fog. So what inspired you to write about that in particular? Um, again, yeah, I, I mean, I've had brain fog myself um, for various reasons. There's several underlying causes. Uh, a lot of them are just li- lifestyle factors like poor sleep, chronic stra- stress, lack of mental stimulation or exercise and poor diet. But um, I've had some of those as well. But um, I had it as a consequence of, you know, a lot of autoimmune diseases are associated with brain fog. So yes. too is migraine um, and, you know, fibromyalgia. And I have all have had all of those. And then I also definitely mm-hmm. had pregnancy pregnancy brain, you know, menopause brain, you know, all those kind of hormonal changes. Um, and I also did experience, um, you know, some of the worry that comes with that, um, mm-hmm. you know, concerns about, you, you know, really, really knowing that there's something not working properly, trying to hide it, feeling yeah. that you can't tell anyone. And I certainly, I was in when, probably when mine was worst was when I was doing my PhD and I had gone from being, 
you know, having a, this incredible memory, which I had gotten uh, from working in Fair City and soap, you know, um, having, you know, you have to learn a lot of lines. So you shoot five episodes a week. Um, and uh, that worked mm. really well for my undergrad degree. I could write 10 essays and learn them all off and then in the exam be able to spew my them gosh. out. Um, so my memory was just really excellent. And also my powers mm-hmm. of, you know, understanding and all those much more complex things. Mm-hmm. And then kind of doing my PhD, I just really felt, no, hold on, my brain is not working as it should be. And that was a combination of, of multiple factors. I did begin to get really bad pain. And that's when I was diagnosed with my um, autoimmune disease. But I was also under stress and and undue pressure at work in terms of being asked to also do someone else's job on top of my PhD um, and not knowing how to say no. And also, I think, you know, as a woman, uh, as an older woman, (laughs) you know, there was this sense that, oh, okay, I have to show that I can do this, you know, that I can do it all. And really, I just should have said no. Uh, And so I was kind of working, um, you know, in the middle of the night as well. So that's just all a recipe for really, really bad brain fog. So I suppose I just felt that it's under-recognized that there's a lot of people out there worrying and wondering and not realizing that there's things that you can do. And, you know, frequently people can go to the doctor with that and the doctor rightly so will try and find the underlying cause, but then don't seem to recognize that actually you know, even if you have an underlying cause that actually the brain fog symptoms are the most debilitating and that you need help with that. And, and I'm still trying to figure out whether, you know, it's that doctors, GPs particularly don't see themselves as responsible for your or your brain, but it's an mm-hmm. organ. So they really should be responsible if any yes. other organ malfunctions. If you go and you say, yes. look, I'm peeing three times a day or, you know, I have this persistent cough, um, they'll try and find what's going wrong. But if you go and say, look, I'm really struggling to remember things or I can't find the right words or, um, you know, I have trouble concentrating, they kind of say, oh, you're probably this and send you home. Do you know? Um, And and it's just a warning sign. You need to figure out what is going on. So the book really aims to empower people to identify the specific domains that are affected because brain fog is just an umbrella term. Uh, And it affects, you know, the symptoms are from various different aspects of our cognitive function. So you'll have memory, which would people would be common, uh, you know, um, familiar with, and you would have language word finding difficulties, but people would be less familiar with what we'd call executive function. But that underlies your ability to make decisions, to be planned, you know, to make plans, to be organized, to assess risk. Um, and, you know, that can be affected. Like some people with brain fog will say, I can't even decide what to wear in the, mo- in, in the morning. Do you know that they're just overwhelmed? And the book sort of helps helps you pinpoint which area of your functioning is affected. And then there's very specific tips for uh, and strategies for managing those, as well as then going through, uh, you know, hormonal changes, underlying health conditions and lifestyle factors that impact on it. And then the 30 day plan really is a gentle uh, gentle resetting of your brain to revitalize it and reintroduce uh, brain healthy habits into your life. Well, oh, it, it's it's very interesting. My my mother was diagnosed with uh, Epstein Barr back in 1986. Oh, right, the Epstein Barr virus. Yes, <laughs> yes, and it, I think back then it was called the Yuppie flu, and then it was called Epstein Barr. Yeah, and then it was called ME, and it's now it's called CFS. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier that you you also had fibromyalgia. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And what what can you can you explain a little bit? To, to me about ME and your knowledge of CFS. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, it's chronic fatigue is what you're saying. I mean, Epstein-Barr the, the virus, um, you know, I mean, it's really debilitating and, and, and affects the brain. And I think that's what a lot of people um, yeah. are experiencing actually post-COVID. You know, any virus that affects the brain is going to um, impact on your brain function and you may well have brain fog for quite a period afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think the interesting thing about chronic fatigue is a lot of people think that's all physical, you know, but um, it's not. It's it's, it's mental not. fatigue and physical fatigue, and yes. you know they're they're two different biological 
functions, you know, mm. you, you know, physical fatigue, um, you will feel that your muscles are tired and that, you know, you, you can't walk or dance or, you know, that you're physically too tired. But with mental fatigue, um, you know, your respiratory system um, isn't affected. Uh, your heart rate isn't affected, which would be affected, you, you know, in terms of you, you need those for the physical um, activities. But what is affected is uh, your ability to to think, um, to remember, to uh, to concentrate, but also it impacts on your mood uh, yes. and your motivation. And a really interesting thing about mental fatigue is mm-hmm. that in people with mental fatigue, the time to physical fatigue is shortened. So it, it, mm. that means you get physically tired quicker than someone who doesn't have mental fatigue. Also, the mental fatigue wow. distorts your perception of how fatiguing things will be or how long you can endure a certain activity. So you have this distorted view of what you're actually able to do. Mm -hmm. So um, I just, it's something that I kind of bring up a lot. I do hate, you know, I mean, we're seeing it a lot with long COVID, people saying, oh, people are just suffering from fatigue for a long time. And I just think people don't realize the impact of that. They think of just someone being physically tired and there's this sense of, and being physically tired is not good either, but there's a sense that like, if you're physically tired, you can still do, you can still think, you, you know, you can do sort of certain mental activities. You can pro- probably read, you know, I mean, if you're mentally fatigued or have, you know, brain fog, I would see mental fatigue as part of brain fog. Like you, you often can't totally. even read a sentence. No. Um, and I know people who have it who can't even follow the plot on a TV show. Like Exactly. That's exactly it. It's just so debilitating. And I just think it's really important that people start to start to distinguish those or at least say physical and mental fatigue because mm-hmm. if you talk to anyone who has that mental fatigue or the brain fog they can't carry out their job sometimes they no. can't even make the dinner no. um it's really and it's tough. not because they can't pick up uh you know a plate you know i mean i had that physical i suppose that but, but it's kind of muscle it's uh, with with fibro it's it's very much muscles but i mm. couldn't even stir the um bolognese <laughs> you yeah, know in the pot and you're it, finished you're absolutely oh, mentally the pains in my arm finished. and to wash exactly. my hair was it, just there you go it, it was just i would dread it I, I you know just to lift my hands over my head for that act it's like i'm never going to get the do i have to put no. conditioner in because that's happened to hold my that's hands it. up too long that's and then right. having to blow dry your hair after which you'd be mm-hmm. nearly ready to get into bed um mm-hmm. to do that but I, the frustrating thing was well, that that was physical, but you still wanted to use your brain, you know? Um, I mean, they're interlinked, I suppose, but, um, uh, they are, they are as everything is, you know, um, but they are different. Um, how, how, how did your mom do? Did she make improvements? Well, she's learned, she's just had to learn how to manage it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, she really kind of, it comes and goes, she has really good days and bad days, but she's learned how to manage it. You know, she'll have regular naps during the day. Um, in my mom's case, she'll never really be able to go back to, to her form, her life, you know, of having, she had a, so much energy and um, like yourself, she, her brain was just incredible what she could remember and do. Um, but in my mom's case, unfortunately, she, she, I don't think, well, she doesn't feel herself that she'll ever go back to that, the person she was, but she has learned how to manage it. And it's interesting because when she was diagnosed, we lived in California. Right. And she was apparently the sixth worst case they had seen in California. Oh, my goodness. And when we came back to Ireland, um, uh, the GPs had no idea what this was. Um, And just like you had said, that's what spurred me to ask you about going into your GP. They were like, well, maybe just leave the window open at night time or... Um, yeah. Maybe you just need some fresh air. or And depending what her age was, there may have been, it's the menopause. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And she's like, no, it's not that. That's not what it is. I don't need fresh air. And she was trying to educate them. She was actually giving her own GP books and information yeah. she had picked up in, in California. It's inter- It's so, you know, it's widely known about now, but at the time it wasn't. Yeah. So brain fog has been a big part of my mom's life and for so many 
Yeah, yeah, no, for a lot. And and I mean, one, if there's a positive in the pandemic from where I'm coming from, it's uh, it's that people are talking about brain fog now because yeah. it's associated with long COVID, but also because people are experiencing what I, you know, call pandemic brain fog, which is really a, con- a consequence of That's really um, multiple lifestyle factors. Uh, you know, chronic stress mm-hmm. is going to bring it about, disrupted sleep, but also one big issue that, you know, that would explain, um, you know, brain fog from lockdown um, from my perspective is that you know your brain is a really high energy organ and um, it consumes about 24 or 25 percent of the nutrients uh, circulating in your body at any time so wow. um, it really has to be efficient in how it uses its energy so the thinking part of your brain uses up the most energy like it takes the most fuel to run and then you have sort of two unthinking parts of your brain one is the brain stem and that just keeps you alive you don't have to think about that it just keeps you breathing and your digestion going and all that. Mm -hmm. And then you have your limbic brain, which is your emotional brain, which again is unconscious and it houses sort of important structures like the amygdala that's involved in the fear response and and Mm -hmm. the hippocampus that's involved in learning and memory. But it also houses another structure called the basal ganglia. And in order to be efficient with the available resources that the brain has, um, it constantly scans for patterns And the reason it does that is if it can identify a pattern in your behavior, say you get up every morning, you know, go pee, brush your teeth, have a shower, you know, whatever your routine is, your pattern, when your brain can identify that a pattern is happening routinely, you know, every day or whatever, you know, period of time in that pattern, your brain can automate that behavior. It actually basically abdicates responsibility for carrying out that behavior to your basal ganglia to the unconscious part of your brain, which is much less resource demanding. So by definition, habits are effortless. Um, And so the, you know, your brain is making the most use of the resources it has, you know, so that your thinking brain can do those um, more difficult, challenging things like making decisions or, you know, assessing risk or um, thinking, writing, whatever your job involves. And if you think back to this time last year, you know, everybody was suddenly just told to go home yeah. and work from home and figure out how to work from home. And a lot of people didn't continue to follow a routine and people started to going to bed and getting up at odd hours and maybe not getting dressed, working in their PJs or, you know, alternating teaching kids with grabbed moments of working. And so everything involved thinking, the thinking brain. And it's exhausting. And your brain does not have the capacity to be thinking about everything. That's really interesting. So the solution really is you've got to reintroduce those routines and preferably the ones that you did pre-pandemic and that will prepare you for going back to work. So if you got up at seven o'clock every morning and had your shower and whatever, go do that again. And and I think for mental health, um, take a commute, go for a walk around the block or a 1K walk before you start the day and at the end of your day and consider, you know, showering at the end of your day and changing into comfies and locking mm-hmm. away the work gear so that you, um, you know, are delineating uh, work and Uh, and home life, you know, in some sort of way. And honestly, people would see a huge improvement in terms of brain fog, but also in terms of their mental health. So interesting. And tell us, how can we have a super brain? How how do you stretch your brain these days, especially with COVID and everything else that's flying around at the moment? Well, I think the key to having a super brain is um, because your brain is really, it really is a superpower. It's the most complex Mm. structure in the known universe. Um, It's also very energy efficient. You know, it takes about 10 watts to run a brain. And I think magnitudes of time to run, you know, for a computer to do the same thing. You know, it's smarter than artificial intelligence. Um, I just think we don't optimize it. And, you know, one of the best ways to do that is to live a brain healthy life. So really prioritize your brain. And that's why I use that very simple example of, uh, you know, brushing your teeth. You know, we all get up every morning and brush our teeth. We brush our teeth twice a day. We know that if we floss and avoid sugary drinks and visit our dentist regularly, that we'll do even better. But we also, you know, realize that, that um, you know, even if we fastidiously follow our dent- dentist's advice, it doesn't come with an absolute guarantee, but you know, you're in a much better position. But really, if we 
adopt a brain healthy lifestyle, we really stand to optimize how it functions, certainly giving it its best chance. And that comes down to the fuel. So the fuel is the food we eat. Um, and, uh, you know, if you eat rubbish, if you put rubbish in your brain, you're going to get rubbish out of your brain. Um, you know, really, you wouldn't put rubbish into the engine of your car. Um, mm. And a lot of us do that all the time. Um, and uh, you've got a physical exercise is hugely important and essential for a healthy brain because your brain depends on a healthy cardiovascular system to transport the nutrient and oxygen nutrients and oxygen that it needs to function um and so you need you know having that in you know tip top shape is going to really uh, improve your brain function but on top of that the endorphins that are released are good for your mental mm-hmm. health but there's also chemicals released that promote the growth of new brain cells so it's like fertilizer for your brain is released when you exercise and you've got to keep stimulating your brain because like I said earlier, you know, in terms of mental stimulation and learning things and constantly challenging yourself and exposing yourself to new experiences, new people, new behaviors, because again, your brain, you know, has to be efficient and it really is use it or lose it. So if you're not using brain cells, your brain will kill them off through a process called apoptosis because it can't afford to waste energy on them. But if you learn new things and give yourself new experiences, uh, you will um, uh, encourage neuroplasticity, which is the growth of new brain cells, new new connections between brain cells. And, you know, that's that's the more connections you have, the more dense they are, the more brain cells, uh, you know, the better connected brain is really uh, a super brain. And you really can kind of push it uh, uh, to its limits. Um, it's just so much I mean, obviously, we only use 10% of our brain as a complete and utter, utter myth. We use all of our brain, but um, I just don't think we maximize its potential. And and I think people underestimate uh, the power of that organ that they have inside their skulls. Absolutely. And so but what you're also saying is like just totally detaching yourself from, from the daily stre- stresses and like having a holiday for your brain as it can have a very positive effect on your brain and health as well. I think, yeah, well, I think the thing is the stress in and of itself isn't bad for your brain. Um, you know, okay. it, you need stress. You need a certain amount in your stress to rise to the challenges I'm talking about, to achieve goals, to keep pushing yourself, you know, to learn anything. Um, that requires a certain amount of, uh, uh, you know, engagement of your of stress system. But there's an optimum amount. You know, I call it like trying to find your stress sweet spot. So too much poorly managed chronic stress um, has really negative impact on both mm-hmm. the structure and the function of your brain. Um, but too little stress is not good for your brain either. Again, you'll get shrinkage and af- atrophy of the brain and it leads to boredom and, and depression. And that in turn will affect um, uh, your cognitive function. So it really is just about finding kind of that optimum time, op- optimum amount of stress. But yes, uh, I mean, balance is key and, and taking time out yes. to, to I, you know, I think that's kind of what you were getting at, taking time out to sort of, Yes. Allow for daydreaming, you know, that your yeah. brain can, um, t- particularly, you know, in, in, in creative work as well. You know, that's where you kind of get insights and ideas come from. You don't always have to force it. You can let information come into your head and then yeah. your brain has all those connections and trust mm-hmm. it. You know, tomorrow it, it might go, ah, I found this interesting connection, you know. Yeah, um, or a solution. You know, a solution. It, even yeah, a hot yeah. bath or, or whatever. Or, you know, walk in the park and then suddenly oh, that, yeah. the, that, the, that problem can be solved yeah. just out of nowhere. Yeah, the balance. Well, it's not coming from nowhere. It's coming from your brain and then from yeah. the fact that you've got a whole life's worth of experience and information in there. And so mm-hmm. if you just throw in the question and other valid information, your brain can make the connections because your brain is just all about connections. I mean, it is a, an information superhighway. You know, the, the, the main Gosh. function of your brain is to transmit information. So um, it has access to all of those. And rather than there being compartments, which is a lot of the way people used to kind of think about the brain, you know, like memory is is stored there, like if it's in a little box. But really, they're stored in these networks, you know, which are all just connections. And I mean, you know that yourself, if if that's why I think a lot of people are missing certainly, you know, um, collaboration, you know, just being in another room with other people, bouncing mm-hmm. ideas off each other can really be a creative Definitely. process. And it's because it triggers 
whole networks, you know, and, and you go off in, 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 in different ways um, and different uh, directions. So you're yeah. kind of very creative as well. Do you, do you, do you, do you do that? Is that, do you let things kind of mull around inside your head? And I do, but then also it, it, it the world that I'm working in, it, it requires a lot of creativity, but you, it also requires a lot of problem solving and um, there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. So, and deadlines, and, yeah. you know, and you're working with lots of different moving parts all the time, every day on a lot of different jobs. And, and then you can get stuck, of course, as well. And, and I often, I now know uh, after years and years of being, I feel like I'm in this business a thousand years, but <laughs> I now know that when I'm really stuck with something, I will literally park it, move yeah. on to something else. And I can be in the middle of a completely different project. And then suddenly I'll figure out how to handle yeah. that little problem I had on the other job. It's amazing. Yeah, no, that is, I mean, that is just, you know, you found the best way to do it. That's exactly kind of what I would say to people to do. Just stop, mm -hmm. just stop, stop and either take a complete break. And I, you know, if you can't afford to take a, a complete break, I often actually, I have a stash of those kind of easy to do jobs um, that if, you know, I really yeah. can't get something done, you know, exactly. and but I still want to feel productive. I have a bunch of stuff that's just, hey, I don't have to think about this. I don't have to be creative. I can just send this invoice out or whatever it is, you know, something that doesn't require use of the same part of things. And I, and I mean, I think what happens is you're, you, you've just pushed it too far and your brain needs some space to, yeah. um, and, and you can't underestimate the value of sleep. Like it is just oh, so gosh. critical, so Definitely. critical. Yeah. So, so, uh, so you've, you've advised us so far on exercise, good health, Exercise, um, sleep, eating well, um, and eating. Sleep. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they're the fundamental: sleep, managing stress, exercising your body and your brain, and managing mm -hmm. your diet. They would really kind of be the fundamental pillars um, uh, to a healthy life. None of it is real rocket science, but I do think in the no. in the book. It is neuroscience, though. So in the book, mm -hmm. I think what helps is that I explain why you need sleep and I explain how poor sleep will disrupt your brain function. And I think that certainly for me, I need to know why, you know, I, you know, I'm happy to do or follow something, but I, I need to know why that works or how that works. Oh, OK, that makes sense. Right. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And another question I have for you is just uh, out of curiosity, retirement. And we have personal friends who are well into their 70s and still running their own businesses and live really active lives. And they've explained to us, well, they say that they'll never, you know, give up their jobs because it's their passion and it keeps them happy and they feel it keeps them mentally sharp. What are your views on that? Yeah, totally with you. I think retirement is over, overrated and I actually think it can be really detrimental to, um, you know what, to physical, mental and brain health. You know, um, I think we all have to have purpose and meaning in life. And, you know, there's only so long you can sit around doing nothing. Of course, if you hate your job and there's something else that you always wanted to do and you're going to do that when you retire, that's entirely different. But I'm thinking about that just stopping, you know, that's really not good. Um, it's not good for your brain. And whether you stop doing one do job and then take up another or, you know, go back to college or, you know, do, just once you you continue to remain both physically and mentally active. I think that's really, really important. But I think it narrows social, um, your social circles as well. You know, I mean, we're all seeing that with lockdown. You know, totally. we, we don't just work for work. You know, the social engagement that comes with, um, you know, going to a workplace and meeting people is very restorative. And it's kind of, you know, uh, social engagement is, is, is challenging. It's a really brilliant, um, you know, it's a brilliant way to stim stimulate your brain. Definitely. And if you're lucky enough to find your passion in life, well, then, you know, that's, yeah, go that's for it. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Go for it. Um, it's funny how I can go for like three weeks flat, pushing all the boundaries and then bang, I'm like totally exhausted. Oh, you like and feel that too. Totally unmotivated. Yeah. And I, and I admit in those moments, I, I think I experienced brain fog. I'm not sure. It, it, it doesn't stay with me for very long, but I have those moments. Yeah. So I'm like that. So I think it's, yeah, yeah. I'm like that. I'm like, you know, I can be the Duracell bunny yeah. for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then it's just, I get to the end and that's 
sort of what, you know, kind of maybe happened to me this weekend. You just get and you kind of go, oh, my God, I'm exhausted. But the, I know now that's 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 my cycle. Do, do you, you know what I mean? Yes. It's like I cycle through that and that's the way I work. Um, and I just have to be careful to manage it that I don't overdo yeah, it too much definitely. and end up making myself ill. Because what I will find is I have all my various things kind of under control. But, um, you know, I will find if I push it too far, oh my God, I have pains, you know, all over my arms and my legs, you know, I I really need to kind of, you know, pull it back. But sometimes it's the nature of the game as well. I mean, and I hear you with yours, you know, when you're working on a project and there's deadlines and, you know, there's budgets and, and, you know, deliveries don't arrive and, you know, you can't get this thing that you built a whole room around, you know, or whatever. (laughs) It Um, It can be mentally and physically exhausting. But exciting. I have to say, yeah, I have to say I have a love. I have a love for all things. Yeah, yeah. I love architecture, love interior design oh yeah, and I do miss rewarding. that yeah. um I'm, I'm I'm I always kind of change up even the interior of my my house every so often just even by changing curtains do you know not curtains I don't have any curtains in my house actually but even just changing cushions you know exactly but your environment I think is really important oh, I absolutely. actually believe color is very important it can lift your mood it can uh you know, I it, I could write a book, I, uh, so they say, you know, so to speak, on on this topic too, because color really is important. And you I should think- write a book. <laughs> color and light for me, yeah. the most important thing um, mm. in a room is is light. I mm. have to have. Um, it has to have light. And obviously, obviously, you need to be able to control that light, too, so that it's dark yeah. if you want to sleep, if it's one of those rooms. But exactly. um, light, yeah. light and more light. Some some colors can really, can, you know, reflect a lot of. Yeah, it like red is a very, I think, a very strong color. Uh, it has to be used very carefully. Yeah. Um, and I've seen people go all out in red. You know, in dining rooms years ago, it was a thing. Yeah. And um, it, it's a very intense color, and I, I think it can really have a negative effect if you if it's just not yeah, used in the right way. It's very strong. I I mean, I have uh, what I like with that is I have a my room in my we've kind of a kitchen sort of living room and I have one a really really small picture on the wall and actually it was just a gift card you know a card that I just thought was very like a very pretty little painting but it's um literally just a cottage but there's in it there's one square of bright red just a flash of bright red and it's tiny it's probably eight by eight yeah and you come in the room and it just lifts the rest of the room is you know muted white screens and you know a splash of blue and then that tiny little bit of red it, it just lifts it it's enough and it literally that the, you know it's probably two inches by two inches but... I know but it's that little pop that's all yeah, you need yeah, yeah 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 exactly so color you need to be really careful with it and and may I ask you a question um can dementia be caused like what are the connections with dementia Alzheimer's stress all those things I'm very interested to learn more about that so dementia is an umbrella term um, and it yes. also means something. So it, it, it's quite confusing. So dementia just really describes when the brain itself malfunctions. OK, that's what dementia is. And then, unfortunately, it's used as an umbrella term to describe all of the different conditions that can give rise to a malfunctioning brain. Um, Now, we're aware aware of Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia, um, but there are other dementias associated with later life, uh, like frontal lobe dementia, Lewy body dementia. um, But Alzheimer's disease is the one that most of the research is done on. Um, Age is the biggest risk factor um, for it. there's a small genetic element, but it's what we call neither necessary nor sufficient, which means that some people who have the genetic element don't get the disease and some people who do get the disease don't have the genetic element. And we also know that that genetic element, the risk associated that is small compared to the risk associated with certain lifestyle factors, which is really, really positive. About 40% of all cases of Alzheimer's disease um, can be attributed attributable to um, a a relatively small number of risk factors and things that we can do something about. So that's kind of really why I kind of initially became passionate about this area, you know. Um, So low levels of physical activity increase your risk of developing dementia. Um, Midlife high blood pressure, poorly managed midlife high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, smoking, um, uh, 
low levels of mental, well, low levels of education, but uh, increases your risk. But we also know from research that ongoing mental stimulation acts as a buffer. So if you've had low levels of education, don't worry about it. Once you keep stimulating your brain and learning new things, you can kind of counteract that. Excuse me. Um, uh, midlife obesity. Um, there's a flip in later life. If you become too thin, um, that becomes the risk. But in midlife, um, it's obesity, um, alcohol consumption, social isolation, um, and um, also exposure to certain um, toxins in the air. Um, but we also then know that there um, that poorly managed chronic stress. Um, you know, suppresses neuroplasticity in the hippocampus, which is disproportionately affected in Alzheimer's disease. So essentially, you'll you'll see a shrinking in the hippocampus um, and an increase in these plaques and tangles, um, which are the kind of hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Um, And there's a relationship, a very strong relationship with poor sleep. Um, uh, Mm. We're not quite sure whether you know, which direction it goes, does the sleep become disturbed because of the disease or vice versa. But we do know that one of the key reasons, and I explain it in the book, one of the key reasons you need sleep is for, um, to clean your brain. So during the day when you're engaged in any activity, um, your lymphatic system is clearing up the metabolic waste as you make it. Um, But as I said, the brain is a really high energy organ, so it produces a lot of metabolic waste and it also is very vulnerable to toxins. But it hasn't got enough resources to be you and do the things you do and fully clean your brain at the same time. So you need to go asleep and it's like the bin lorries coming around at night and going around the empty streets. They can do a proper deep clean. So if you're not getting that sleep, those toxins start to build up. And one of the toxins is beta amyloid, which is a, a major culprit um, in Alzheimer's disease. Oh my so gosh. prioritizing sleep is critical. And it's one message that I really try and push out there because, yeah. you know, they say one in three people are, are sleep depri- deprived. You know, the World Health Organization declared a sleep loss epidemic. And it has, aside from um, aside from dementia, you know, poor sleep uh, gives rise to so many health issues, Mm -hmm. you know, and and it can put you in like just a a few days of of missed sleep can put you into a pre-diabetic state. Um, Oh, my gosh. If you if you, uh, you know, if you're constantly getting poor sleep, you will eat more between three and 600 more calories the next day. And you'll seek those calories from sugar and fat. So, you know, disrupted sleep can cause you to gain weight. You know, I mean, it really just has this huge knock on effect. Yeah. And sleep and stress are just so closely uh, related that, um, you know, one feeds off the other. So that's actually why in in Beating Brain Fog, you know, I have a 30 day plan. The first week is devoted to to just trying to introduce sleep rituals, you know, what to do sort of in the morning and the evening, just because honestly, if you can prioritize that and get your sleep in good shape, uh, mm-hmm. you really will feel all sorts of health benefits and definitely feel a, hum- a, a huge improvement in your in your brain function. My gosh, and, and high blood pressure, that is so yeah, interesting. M- Midlife high blood pressure. Well, again, it comes down to the fact that you need a healthy cardiovascular system for a healthy brain. So um, balance, balance, balance. I have a um, I have a little animation actually. I'm, I'm, I have a website, superbrain.ie, and down the bottom there's tons of free resources. Everybody's welcome to go and look them and share them and and use them. That's what they're there for. But I think if you click through somewhere, you'll find. Um, um, uh, an animation that I made that explains why high blood pressure is bad for your brain. But it's midlife poorly managed. So there's a lot of people walking around with high blood pressure who don't know they have high blood pressure. So just go, and, and it's free testing now in in most chemists. So just go and get your blood pressure tested. If it appears high, go to your GP, follow their advice, and that'll usually be either dietary lifestyle or maybe some uh, medications and get that blood pressure under control as soon as you possibly can. And, and, and that will help immensely in terms of reducing your risk. My gosh. And I've, and I've read that brain fog affects more women than men. Well, why does, why yes, is so certainly, certainly before the pandemic, I would say that I don't know whether it's changed since then, but um, mainly because so there's 
aside from the lifestyle factors, basically then the causes of underlying causes of brain fog um, are health conditions, uh, particularly autoimmune diseases, um, chronic pain and inflammatory conditions. And if you just take autoimmune diseases, they disproportionately affect more women than men. Um, Secondly, um, hormonal changes or hormonal imbalance frequently underlie brain fog and females, you know, go through throughout their lives, go through lots of hormonal changes, you know, and particularly around um, coming up to periods. So if PMS, uh, pregnancy, you know, and you've heard of pregnancy brain or baby brain yes. and menopause brain. So I think what people don't realize is we think when we think of hormones, number one, we tend to just think of the sex hormones. We have lots of other hormones. Mm -hmm. uh, hormones are part of the communication system uh, in your brain and your body. Um, uh, the other part really is uh, our neurotransmitters. But hormones have wide ranging um, impact and they ensure that all of your body kind of is on the same page in terms of, of messaging. So like you have estrogen receptors in your brain, you have them in the part of your brain involved in learning and memory. So if there's a imbalance in your estrogen levels or, a, um, you know, that's going to impact on your cognitive functioning. Um, and then there's various other, you know, if you've a, a hyper or hypoactive thyroid um, gland, that will impact on your, your cognitive function um, as well. So, uh, you know, basically we're sort of this fine tuned um, organ. And if things go out of whack or out of balance, um, um, it, it it more likely than not will impact on um, on on your brain function. So I mean that's my answer in in a way. Why more women than men? Um, you know, really in a way because of the the underlying um, health conditions or the hormonal changes. There hasn't been a lot of research done on men in terms of hormonal changes. So you know maybe maybe that's there. You know m maybe it does exist. Unfortunately, also um, brain fog can be the consequence of you know, a side effect of medications, frequently the medications used to treat uh, many of those autoimmune conditions, um, yeah. painkillers, anything that operates on your central nervous system. So certain culprit medications in terms of brain fog would be uh, antihistamines, anti-nausea tablets, anti-depression, anti-anxiety. Nobody should ever top, wow. stop taking a medication that has been prescribed. But if you think that your brain fog may be a consequence of a medication, you go and you speak to your doctor and see if there's something else, um, you know, that you can that you can do or substitute uh, with, you know, frequently there's there's a few different lines of choices. A depression also is associated with uh, with brain fog. My gosh. And uh, just a silly question, but can children There's no suffer... such thing as a silly question. <laughs> but can children suffer from brain fog? Yeah, I can't see why not. <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, they can, I mean, uh, they're, they're, they're not different creatures from us, you know. Um, they they are going through develop, development, so they can be vulnerable to stress just like we ha we can. They can have their sleep disrupted, um, you know, if they sustain a brain injury, if they have a virus, um, you know, uh, Lots of viruses, not just the COVID virus, lots of viruses after surviving them, you know, will impact on the brain function. And that's probably for a number of reasons. It might be an excessive, um, you know, you know, continuing inflammation or excessive uh, immune response. But it also can be just a resource issue that your body, your brain has to put all of its resources into keeping you alive and fighting the infection. So it really doesn't matter if you can't remember where you're, you put your keys or you can't learn off the 10 words for your spelling test. So no, uh, you know, uh, kids have experienced it after, after certain issues and, and they would, they're, they're, you know, their brain is growing and changing and particularly so during teen years. And, and I mean, what we would see, you know, kind of a prime example of how the environment and our behaviors influence our brain. You know, if, if, if a child has been exposed to trauma in childhood, yes. you know, that can disrupt their stress resp response and they can have a, uh, a maladaptive or inappropriate stress response, which then as they become adults means that, you know, maybe they're chronically stressed, maybe they get stressed sooner than they, sh that, than they should be. And that's going to impact on their brain function. So I, something that I'm very keen on, um, and actually that's what I'm kind of was working on this morning is I'm very keen to start writing children's books around these things so that we Definitely. can, so that we can prevent <laughs> rather Definitely. than cure. I think it's just so mad that nobody really knows how their brain works. 
works. <laughs> no, I, 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 it is. It's so interesting. I'm not sure, but did you happen to see a documentary that was on Sky last year? It was called Crazy Not Insane. No, um, I didn't, but and, I will look it up. Oh, it will interest you. Um, it's it's it was about uh, it's about this uh, clinical psychologist in America, and she her name is Dorothy Otnow Lewis. I'm I'm sure I'm not pronouncing her the second name correctly, but um, she she worked with uh, many famous serial killers, and she studied their brain. And she, she oh, wanted, I did see it. I did yeah. see it. I just didn't recognize the name. Yes, I yeah. did. I Wasn't did. That fascinating. Yeah, really, really fascinating. And to yeah, go into their childhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just as you mentioned, children, and then the brain, and then that 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 lady came into my mind. Just that whole subject around children and catching these things from a very early age, and yeah, and being aware of how important the brain is. And how vulnerable it is, you know. Yeah, it's also yeah. a very, re- it's also very resilient too. But mm-hmm. I just think that knowledge is power, and I, I, I just think, you know, in terms of mental health, in terms of self awareness, in terms of understanding True. yourself and why you do this and why you do that, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it kind of is very empowering when you realize, oh, I behaved like that because that's my trigger for that, and actually, if I just do this, I might be able to change that behavior. Do you know it? it Mm-hmm. That's kind of really where I'm coming from. So how important is? Uh, do you believe your home environment is to your brain health? I know we tapped on that earlier, but do you believe it's very important? I think it is hugely important. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah. No, I mean, I have probably invested... For me, I probably have invested, you know, everything I've ever earned sort of really into the house, you know, though, yeah. and my kids' education, that aside. But what I'm saying is I would rather I would rather have a nice home than go out for meals every night of the week or go on holidays once even or twice a year. Do you know what I mean? I mean, for mm-hmm. me, the priority is... Um, is my home and having my home looking nice. And that's actually one thing that I can't wait. I need to do some work in my home and I want to get a new, <laughs> I want to get a new floor and a new kitchen. Uh, I want to get one of those. And I have no, see, this is where I'm kind of scared too. I have no idea. I really have this idea. I have open plan, split level downstairs, Ooh. but we also have a slightly crooked house. Okay. And I have, I have at the moment, I have travertine marble tiles on the floor and um, I also have four dogs. So it's constant cleaning. <laughs> I know. I hear you. <laughs> but I really, yeah. Now my husband keeps saying, well, I'm sure this will be easier, but I think it will. But I, I just to get rid of all the squares and the grouts, I've been thinking about um, getting up poured concrete floor oh, polished up wow. right the way through, but like a white one. <laughs> yeah. Cool. It, I mean, it, 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 it's so beautiful and, and it'll brighten up your space for sure. Brilliant with the doggies. Oh, is durable. it brilliant with, is it? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I can't, I can't uh, imagine why it, it wouldn't be. I mean, it sounds like it's just really it would be a practical choice for you. Oh, I think, well, I just, I also like the idea of, you know, it kind of going up the steps into the different rooms, Gorgeous. that sort of thing as well. You know, I just think it would be, um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, la- you- a year or two ago, we put silver granite in our garden. Oh, uh, uh, oh my God, the light. Like yeah, even in the gorgeous. depths of winter, you look mm-hmm. out in the garden and it's so bright. It just reflects the light up um, throughout the Beautiful. house. Yeah, it's really, really so, nice. No, this home environment is, is, is oh, it's, it's and crucial. And, and greenery and all those things. Yeah, I'm very, I'm, I'm not a clutter person. So I like, I have very little bits and bobs yeah I would have plants you know nice shaped plants um I have kind of let me see I have one two I have three white sofas and one kind of orangey tan one. Oh, wow. <laughs> so mostly everything is kind of white or cream wow, but so like you're that, minimalist at oh, heart, really. yeah kind of am yeah yeah I came from a very <laughs> cluttered house um and I just like yeah yeah I just like those clean lines and I I have my glass and steel staircase and just yeah a lot of people hate that they think that's I I, I, there was a thing actually on um I think oh god was it 
It was one in one of the home, you know, in the newspapers yes. there recently. There was, you know, they would pick a house for sale. And uh, I think this one was down in Wicklow on an amazing plot. I think it was about three and a half million. But it was just my dream home. It was just glass and steel and huge ceilings and um, white floors. <laughs> it was just magnificent. You loved and it. I loved it. And I remember I put it up on Twitter and someone else had said, oh, I loved it. And then the amount of people said, you can have it. I wouldn't give you a penny for it, you know. Oh my gosh. Um, Everyone's different. Everyone yeah. has a different style. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so where's your favorite place in your home? Where do you like to go and have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea? And I I probably have, can I have two? I have one upstairs and one downstairs. The one upstairs mm-hmm. is my is my bedroom because I have two fabulous windows. We put two kind of Gothic arch windows at the front and there's trees right in front of them. So I can see the birds in the trees and, you know, in, in the morning. And it's just, it's a lovely, it's a big bedroom. It's a wide bedroom. And then really, I suppose if the other place I would sit is we have a sofa along the window that looks out on that new garden and I have a water feature. And at nighttime I have lights gorgeous. and it's just, oh, it's just gorgeous to look at it. I could just sit there looking at that for, for ages. That sounds real funny. It's all, But it is that, isn't it? It's that vantage yeah. point, point from in. Yeah site where you can look out so I love birds I'm, I'm mad about their behavior I often photograph them so that's kind of why I said the upstairs in the, in the morning and then yeah my, my that outdoor garden gosh that saved us during the first lockdown as well because it's a real little sun trap I know and the weather was so blissful yeah. last year we were so blessed so what's your morning ritual how do you Sabina wake up in the morning how does your day begin well I always start with a smile I really do <laughs> Okay. I actually actively smile and, and and it's something I suggest everyone does because it has such great health benefits. I go to the bathroom. When I'm in the bathroom, again, there's a huge big tree at the side of my bath. We're sort of nestled in trees. I have a muse house. So it's big Victorian houses on one road. I live on Castle Avenue, Clontarf, which is really old houses and the same behind. And, and, and they have large gardens and we're sort of nestled between the two roads. So there's a lot of old trees around. So I love looking at the birds. To be honest, um, what I do in the my morning ritual really depends is dictated by my work day. So mm-hmm. sometimes it begins with a workout and a walk and then I come back to work. But if I wake up and I've been wrestling with the problem like we were talking about and I found a solution or a way in, I'll go straight into that and get that down on paper and then maybe go for a walk at, you know, 11 o'clock. Um, alternatively, if I'm doing a podcast or an interview, it takes so long at my age to look good. I'll start straight into the <laughs> into the makeup on the hair. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> oh, oh dear. So, yeah, it just it really does depend on the day. And how do you unwind in the evening? Um, I like to read. Um, okay. And I like to listen to, I do like, like to listen to audio books. Uh, I don't watch as much, um, I don't watch as much TV as I used to. I am a bit of a devil for continuing to, to work. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I guess kind of uh, reading or actually if I am to watch TV, I do love to switch off watching shows like um, Grand yeah. Designs and oh okay uh, oh yeah no absolutely love style. it oh yeah no Grand Designs are okay. um, whatever Home of the Year or you know oh, there's some fab shows on Netflix like uh, you know where houses are built in really unusual remote settings or just yeah fantastic amazing so architectural designs Absolutely. i don't know one comes Love to them. mind i can't remember the name of the show but the the house was built like an airplane you know oh, wow oh it was incredible it had this central channel and then like these wings and it was built into the, oh i just love that stuff i just love that stuff i really do yeah. so um, you can get lost in that you probably need a lot of switching off in the <laughs> i do That's like good. to switch off with that kind of stuff though you yeah. know I, and it's um yeah yeah uh no it's and, lovely and how do you work your own writing process sabina do you do you find it all comes very easy to you writing no yes um no it depends again it's like you say you know you can be in the flow sometimes and then not um yeah. i think it takes uh i think it takes a combination i think it has to have discipline you have to sit down so during the lockdown when i was writing this last book 
Excuse me. You know, in those first few scary days, I mean, we've all sort of forgotten about it, but we were really scared, you know, and people were listening to the news and all people were doing was just going, oh, my God, what's happened? And I knew I had to be getting several hundred words a day down on paper and my brain just wasn't feeling creative. But what I did do then, you know, for that period was I created the structure. Do you know what I mean? And, And I did the research. And so, you know, I kind of went, well, I want to write about that. Here's a paper, an academic paper or whatever. And I would just put all the links, do you know? And then eventually I started to get in flow again and, um, uh, you know, started to write. But at least I was getting something done, you know, something sort of tangible. I have to find I have to find a way into a book. So you kind of, you know, by the time you've got a publishing deal, you've done a good bit of work in that you really know what your content is going to be because you've that's got to be pitched to the pub- publisher. So you kind of have that, but every book kind of needs a way in. And for Beating Brain Fog, um, it took me a little while, but once I found that way in, uh, then it was so much easier. And really, I, I quote from I have to remember how to pronounce his name. Sutsan, I think it is, The mm-hmm. Art of War. Mm. And I use quotes from that uh, throughout the book. Um, and uh, that really helped. And it helped me sort of divide the book into uh, knowledge, power, change and future. So knowledge is power and you can change your future. And the book just, it it, it just fits um, It just kind of came then, you know, mm-hmm. naturally, obviously, um, but yeah, I, I, I suppose it's a bit like building. You, ca- you kind of have to understand your structure before you can start. Definitely. Your structure and your theme. So I suppose, you know, using the stuff from the Art, art of War was kind of the theme and a, a little a thread that you could run through the house, like, you know, through the house, do you hear me, through the book. But you know what I mean? You have something that connects everything Definitely. something subtle but then you you still have to know well this is here and 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 I suppose it's the same as well in a way you know you 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 have to have structure and you have to keep asking is it service is it serving the purpose you know what's the purpose of this chapter so you know I uh, and you have to give people with a book I think with a book like this uh, where it's non-fiction you have to give them some sort of you know, the reader some sort of pattern so they know what to expect does exactly. that make sense? You yeah. know, so Definitely. it's kind of finding those ways in, and, and 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 actually, then once you have that sort of pattern, you know, each chapter becomes um, a little bit easier. But it's about yeah, for this trying to find that balance between how much science is too much, and this was much easier to write actually than the first one because um, I had the benefit of writing one and and could trust myself. A have you already more. have you already started making plans for your third next book? Yes. <laughs> really? Yes. Can yes. you share any of that with us? Well, I well yeah, I mean I want to write a book uh, and I haven't I mean I have an outline done and we need to build that out and 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 go but I really want to write um I want to write a book about self um, about how we, how the brain constructs who we are and how we can deconstruct that and rebuild you know, maybe a healthier self or sense of self. So we're really just exploring that sense of self, who we are. Um, people often think that's fixed, but it's really made um, and Definitely. put together from, it's constructed by your by your brain, by information. And some of that information is erroneous. So some of that information may be from a school teacher who told you age seven, you'd never amount to anything. Or a parent who said, you're always untidy. Or do you know, and and... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just to kind of pull that apart and give people um, insights into, um, uh, yeah, our, our sense of self and how we can how we can switch that up. And do you think that people there's a pattern in people where they quickly they would believe something negative about themselves before they believe something positive? Oh, absolutely. The brain is the brain is um, the brain is primed to notice the negative, and that's really Gosh. from a survival perspective. Unfortunately, we let it go into other parts of our age our, of our life where it's not mm-hmm. an issue of survival. So um, your brain is primed primed to notice the negative because that could save your life. Um, you know. So uh, whereas 
Okay. If you miss a positive, um, it may be a missed opportunity, but it's not going to be life threatening. So, you know, you have to know, say, for example, by the negative, you know, if you walk down that alley, there's thorns in that bush, you'll get cut. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So yeah. you'll be primed to notice that. Um, and you may not see all the really pretty flowers that are on the other side of the laneway. Um, so you'll remember that lane for the negative that's it. Yeah. Um, so what's your view then of social media? Because it's filled with both, you know, positivity, oh, negativity, yeah. what's real, what's not real. You know, I, uh, I just think Twitter originally was set up for this place to give people a voice, or, you know, to allow the, the, the voiceless be heard. And it's just turned into the most horrific bullying ground. Um, and it's a very... Um, Oh, very black and white. You're with us. You're against us. If you're wrong, on, you know, if you disagree with someone on one thing, you know, you're completely this whole thing of, you know, um, what do they call it? It's not uh, cancelling, cancel culture. Um, it really just, uh, it's not healthy. I wouldn't be on it except for, you know, really, you know, it's part and parcel of kind of promoting a book and connecting with people. Um, I've recently started to use Instagram much more and that's a much prettier place um but then i suppose the perfectionist <laughs> in me <laughs> um <laughs> wants to learn how to do all these things brilliantly and uh spends far too long trying to trying to come up with you know nice visual posts and and i really just don't um have the time uh to do it but it is a prettier place um the only thing is i think it also has uh no constraints in that people can sort of promote and advocate woo woo <laughs> you know this yeah. is this is the best i tried this and you know there isn't really that space to say well actually do you know what there's no science behind that do you know it's um it, it's maybe to the other extreme but i yeah yeah i mean it's changing our world completely hopefully uh um i i yeah i don't know i don't know what the uh the answer would be i'd love to switch off it completely uh i'd be so much more productive as well it's 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 interesting though because it is literally like a social you know a uh, thing for a lot of people yeah no it's, it's a great people yeah, yeah. It, yeah definitely definitely is but it no 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 it's a negative as well yeah. yeah it really is important for that and you know uh, you know when i was growing up you know if if your friends went off somewhere without you you had no way of contacting them you know mobile yeah. phones um and you really could be left you know isolated in our own homes uh, you know as as kids that was kind of tough um no i think it's it's with ev it's with everything it's about using it. I was talking to actually one of the guests on my podcast and she's mm -hmm. actually, um, she's a content creator. She's an online gamer and uh, Una, oh Ming, Una Ming And she, yeah, she does her online game, gaming in both English and Irish. Uh, really interesting uh, young woman. But uh, she introduced me to the concept of, of, of digital minimalism. So it's ensuring that you only use your digital technology and social media to benefit you. So it's about sort of doing that, um, I suppose, a bit like a home edit, you know, well, what am I yeah. using? How often am I using it? Well, actually, is that benefiting me? Well, actually, you know what? It, I'd be much more beneficial if I, um, you know, just look at my email, you know, at 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock. Or if I, you know, only look at uh, Twitter between 6 and 7 in the evening time. Do you know what I mean? And, and just and do the thing. Do the things that it that you intend um, you intend to use it for, but it's just so easy to get dragged into. Yes, literally, you get stuff. literally and sucked in. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, you can get sucked in, and you not only lose time, but you also end up, you know, getting stressed or in arguments or trying to explain yourself and say, <laughs> exactly. "No, that is not what I meant. I had 140 <laughs> characters. Why are you choosing to, you know, misinterpret know. this? But you said so. Yeah, it's just a place for people. Um, yeah, yeah, to yeah. have arguments, which is not good. And they may not be as busy as you are, so yeah, you have to yeah. bear that in mind. Are you a spiritual person? Do you believe there's a higher being in life? No, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not a spiritual person, mm -hmm. and I know that sounds like a negative. No, <laughs> but I, I, just, I just everyone. yeah, I believe. I believe in in humanity, and I, I just believe that that's that we're so amazing. 
Mm-hmm. I just believe there's just so much amazing stuff on this planet, you know, that I, um, I'm just invested in in that. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I'm just yes, invested in the beauty that are, is around us. In for me, it's understanding, you know, humans and what we do, and enjoying and connecting with the world rather than living my life in a way for a higher power or you know yes. or, do, do you know what I mean I just you're think totally present you're, you're I'm very trying present. to be yeah very yes. present and doing things because they're good or they're right or they give exactly. me joy or rather mm-hmm. than for other reasons which I think some people do you know I mean I certainly yes. would have been raised a Catholic um, and I know that's religious rather than spiritual but um yeah that probably sort of sent me you know a different way um and I may have been spiritual at some point, but I'm actually very, very comfortable with where I am, that that we have this amazing world uh, to explore and engage in and look after and understand. And I'm kind of comfortable with that. Um, and I remember actually when my father passed away, my kids, my parents would have looked after my kids when they were tots, you know, before they went to school, when I was still working. And uh, I remember my son, I mean, it was 2011. I'm trying to just remember the years, how old. Yeah, so um, Gavin would have been in his teens, I think, my youngest. And I remember him saying he was really annoyed because obviously my parents had a Catholic funeral, but he found it very, very irritating that the priest was speaking as if he knew my dad, but then talked about him. You'd meet him in another life. And of course, my kids, you know, grew up with me, you know, and he he found that really, really annoying, you know, but he said, I don't know what to do with it. And I just sort of said, look, um, your father's, your, your grandfather is always in you, with you. He's in your genes. You carry him with you wherever you go. He's in your memories because you spent so much time with him. And um, uh, you can keep him in your heart by keeping him alive. And, and oh. I just, that to me is, you know, yeah, that, that kind of sense. means more. And it really yes. gave him great comfort. Oh, I never thought about that. I said, he's always with you because you are of him. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, um, yeah, so I, I suppose that's kind of the way I think. I don't like to think too much, uh, you know, about after because what I would tend to think about, about, you know, and I remember I struggled with that after my father died, you know, thinking about rotting bodies and stuff. And I'm yes. gonna go, oh. But I suppose that's the way of it, though. That then feeds and creates new life, doesn't it? And and that's how the world. That's the cycle. That's the cycle, you know, and yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And who who's inspired you the most in your career? I don't know. Um I was thinking you know uh, about that and I suppose and uh, who's who would inspire me you know would be someone like David Attenborough. I've never met him. Um I just I want to be that person who is still curious, still working, still passionate about what they do in their 90s. Um, so I would love to be that person. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I, in terms of someone that I have met and met when I was an actor who inspired me in terms of how to be as a person would have been Helen Millen, Mirren. Oh, love her. Uh, she's an amazing actress, always respected her, uh, what, had a tiny scene in a movie um, with her. She was in the dressing room the same time as me. She treated me as if I was, you know, the same as her. Do, do you know what I mean? Just as love she treated it. me just as another human being. Mm-hmm. We were on set. It was in a big warehouse and there was a delay. Something was going on and um, she noticed that I had got cold and sent one of the runners to go and get my coat. And I said, I "I want to be that human being, you know, she, and she was like huge, like at that point, you know, and I just said, okay, that's the kind of person I want to be, you know, not too big for your boots always. Cause that's what I've always felt is we're just all humans. I'll respect your knowledge. I'll respect your experience, but I'm not going to put you up on a pedestal and be in fear of you we exactly. are equal and and she just manifested that she not only was she um sort of treating everybody you know with equal Equally. respect she was also watching out for how others Sweet. might be i thought it was re- yeah, yeah 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 so she's a beautiful person inside and out yeah yeah seem plus extremely talented and oh also gosh, from any interviews amazing. i've ever heard with her a great sense of humor <laughs> 
I, I saw her, uh, gosh, a couple of years ago. She was on a, I think it could have been the Graham Norton show. And she was talking about how she got really annoyed um, during, she was on the stage somewhere in London doing a play. And she could hear noise out in the alleyway. And it yeah. really irked her. And how she went down, she went outside and she was shouting at the guys out in the alleyway. And she was like, guys, I'm doing my job. Can you keep it down? And I thought it was just so funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she could just come down to that level. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, she seems like a really, really grounded, Grandy, nice grounded individual. Person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so what what three words would you use to describe yourself? Oh, gosh. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> gosh, that's a funny one. Uh, what three words would I use to describe myself? Uh, uh, I suppose I'm... I'm very hardworking. <laughs> Is that a word you can say? <laughs> um, gosh. Tenacious. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, God, I'm really struggling on that one. How would I describe myself? I'm passionate. thinking more about how... Oh, yeah, no, yeah, there we are. Yes, I would say I'm passionate. I am... Um, I'm curious, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Passionate, curious, uh, tenacious maybe yeah yeah um I suppose that's that's funny I'll have to go and think about that one (laughs) (laughs) and where do you see yourself in the next five or even ten years I would love to be um, I would love to be presenting something on a TV show. I would love to be reaching out. Oh, I mean, that's where I'm it would be so good. I'm really comfortable. I like the yes. medium. I have a previous history in it. So that's something that that's on my, uh, you know, to do list that I would love to do. Um, yeah. I'd like to still be writing books and I actually think I'd like to still be podcasting. There's just something so intimate about the medium um i like the idea of having my own podcast too because i can do what i want <laughs> Exactly. You've got the freedom. But, but it, you would be terrific on your own show. Definitely. I yeah, would, watch I would love that. that now. I would love that. And again, really just exploring curious things and curious yes. people and, you know, wherever mm. it goes. But yeah, that's that's on my um, that's on my uh, how would you put it? My bucket list of things that I would like to do. But how interesting just chatting about all things of the brain and beating brain fog. I mean, that's an endless topic in itself. Yeah, anything. Well, I mean, the brain is involved in everything we do. So you can explore anything from that neuroscience perspective, oh. you know. Well, someone out there hopefully will pick <laughs> you up and this will happen for you. No doubt it will. <laughs> and if you could give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be looking back at your younger self? Oh, to be much more accepting. Yeah, yeah. To, mm-hmm. to you know, I was probably um, impatient, irritable. <laughs> <laughs> angry too soon yeah a lot of that was hormones I thought in my defense <laughs> I love it I love it uh, but yeah to be more accepting and and mm. and patient and be in the moment I was always yeah things weren't happening quick enough for me or yeah 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 push too hard probably yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I do think that's probably something that comes with um, with wisdom and with calming down of your hormones as well <laughs> in my case anyway <laughs> Now I'm going to just quickly run through what we call the quick fire round of questions. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Tea or coffee? Neither. Cats or dogs? Uh, dogs. Home or abroad? Home. Eat in or take out? Eat in. Texting or talking? Talking. Window or aisle seat? Aisle seat. Cooking or baking? Cooking. Writing or acting? Writing. Neuroscience or psychology? <laughs> oh, neuroscience. And final question. 2020 or 2021? 2021, because 2020 is gone. Yeah, exactly. We've got loads to look forward to. Yeah. Oh, I'm still torn on the on the neuroscience and the psychology. I think I answered <laughs> neuroscience because I know people think it's sexier rather than going, oh, yeah, they're all linked really, aren't they? <laughs> they are. They are. You feel like you're cheating on one or the other, but yeah. you're not really. <laughs> well, you have to get busy now in 2021 writing your next book. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I got the, yeah, I, I, I have to get, I'm, my agent is waiting for me to hand a 12 page outline to where I've done a three page outline well you're some woman for one woman no better woman than you to tackle that actually we'll see we'll see 
Well, uh, Sabina, thank you so much for chatting with me today. And I'll really, really look forward to reading your book, Beating oh, Brain Fog. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure chatting with you today. So thank you very much. And you take care. Thank you.